Welcome back to Overcome Babylon. I'm Abraham Ojeda. And look, if you've been wondering about the thousand year reign of Christ, the millennial reign, the locking up of Satan for a thousand years, the Gog and Magog war of Ezekiel 38, 39, and Revelation 20, if you've been wondering about what, you know, what is the first resurrection, what's the second resurrection, what's the new Jerusalem, I'm going to cover basically all these topics today, but one thing I'm going to be really doing is grabbing that sword of truth, stabbing it into the all-seeing eye of the New World Order and all the mystery Babylon religions, stabbing it right in the eye and just using that sort of truth to absolutely destroy this information and the teachings and doctrines of men that have really clouded and surrounded and suffocated these scriptures and this these topics for quite some time now. So buckle up, get ready, because I'm not holding anything back. Alright, before we get into today's content, let's go ahead and take a look at that countdown timer. And we are now at 355 days away from the abomination of desolation set to take place next year, literally almost a year from now. Um, and it's going to be devastating. Keep an eye out for it. We're going to continue to proclaim these days, uh, all these end times days that I've been showing you. And the biggest one, in my opinion, is the abomination of desolation. So keep an eye out for that. Okay. Satan locked for a thousand years fulfillment. I'm going to show you some really interesting things. Before I do, let's just take a look at what most Christians believe, okay? Well, most people of the book, most people that believe in the Bible, this is what they understand, okay? Now, um, obviously, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the Seventh day Adventists, some, you know, they're not in this, but, let, you know, this is kind of complicated. You know, you got, you got all these periods of time. This is a lot on the screen. So let's just break it down piece by piece. This is all based off of the 70 weeks of Daniel. 70 weeks are determined for your people in your holy city. This is Daniel 9, 24. So, and that's only part of it. There's more to that verse, but let's just look at this first part. If you look at the word weeks, it, it, it's not, it's not weeks, right? In the original language, it's, it's Shabuah, which I've shown you is 49 year period. One Shabuah is a 49 year period, but everybody and their mother teaches that it's seven years. Everybody, every, like every, everybody, even anyway, all the religions, all religions teach seven years. And so they get, you know, seven times 70 and you get 490. Okay. So that's, that's the first piece. Okay. Then what do they, what does everybody teach? Well, and this is everybody, the Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, everybody, everybody teaches this. The commandment to build Jerusalem that, you know, Cyrus, Nehemiah, that whole thing was, that, that was the, that kicked off the first seven weeks, which they say is 49 years, seven times seven. And then you got 62 weeks after that until Jesus shows up. So that's 69 weeks. So according to this interpretation, 69 weeks has, has already happened, uh, basically way back in the day, thousands of years ago, uh, BC and then first century AD, it was fulfilled. But then they say there's this church age, right? This is what most Christians believe. There's this church age, this unspecified interval of time and there's a huge question mark. We don't know how long it is. We have no clue. We're just we're just waiting for these other two question marks to happen. One of them is the rapture of you know the rapture of the church at the beginning of the seventieth week, the final seven year tribulation period of time. It could happen. The tri the rapture could happen at the beginning. It could happen in the middle. Some people even say the end, but I think most people it's like the beginning or the middle, mid trib pre-trib rapture where, you know, poof, people that believe in God are just taken out of the world and no, no big deal. You're not going to see anything bad. This is what everybody teaches. So like, again, so I, I've done a, a little overview now. Now you can look at this chart and be like, okay, I understand it. So this is what people, they look at Daniel 9, 24, and they make this, all these doctrines off of it that, okay, the first 69 weeks already happened way long ago. It was fulfilled in the first century AD. There's this church age. We have no clue, but one day there's going to be a rapture. We're going to be poofed uh, somewhere so that the tribulation period doesn't really affect us. So the thing I really want to dive into though, right? Because I've already covered that quite a bit in the podcast, but I had to kind of cover it again because when we're talking about the thousand years, the thousand year reign, millennial reign, this is what the mainstream, you know, really teaches that at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, there's the second coming of Christ. Satan is bound for a thousand years and then the millennial reign can begin. Okay, we have a thousand years, peace on earth, Satan's loosed, and then at the, at the very end, he's loosed, and then you have the rebellion of Gog and Magog. And the prophecies of, his, of Revelation 20, 
along with Ezekiel 38 and 39, are then fulfilled at the very end of that thousand-year reign. Uh, so let's take a look at Revelation 20 and just kind of see, okay, this is what everybody teaches. Let's just take a look at it real quick. We're going to dive into this in more detail later. Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So according to the mainstream, this will be fulfilled not after the 70th week, but thousand years after the 70th week. Okay, and then the next one is Revelation 38. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 38. We're not going to look at Ezekiel 39. So let's just look at a little piece of 38. Uh, let's look at 38, 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says Yehovah Elohim, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place from the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me. When I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says Yehovah Elohim, Are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? Boom. Okay, so the vast majority of people believe, again, Satan is going to be locked away for a thousand years right after the seven-year tribulation period, which they say is the 70th week. Again, one week, one Shabuah being a seven-year period. Then, just to recap, you know, after a millennial reign with Christ, the same Satan is going to be released, gather up a bunch of armies together for the final battle of Armageddon, and then he will be destroyed and burned in the lake of fire. So this is what everybody's teaching. There's a few problems with it, though, okay? Number one, big, humongous problem is that rebellious mankind is actually not going to exist after the 70 weeks is, is, is done. That's exactly what, what, what it says here. Remember, we read the first part. 70 weeks are determined. So if you look at Daniel 9.24, it says to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That's the other part of the verse that I didn't show you at first. But it literally says that there's going to be an end of sin at, at, as soon as the 70 weeks are done. Like 70 weeks are decreed. It's determined. That's what that word means. It's decreed. Like it's, it's done. It's a cutoff. Uh, and then the second problem. So that's the first problem. No more sin. The second problem is that all vision and prophecy in the entire Bible will be finished at the end of the 70 weeks. That's what it says. To seal up vision and prophecy. Hatam. That word in Hebrew. To seal and to seal up. I'll show you that in a second. I'll show you more. So it, it's impossible for the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39, along with Revelation 20, to happen a thousand years after the 70th week is done. Okay? And then the third, the third problem is that Jesus himself told us all things will be fulfilled during the days of the abomination of desolation. That's what it says in Luke 21, 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, no, then know that its desolation is near. I've talked about this a lot in the podcast. I've shown you that it is the abomination of desolation. Then you look at Luke 21, 22. For these are the days of vengeance that all things, all things which are written may be fulfilled. So again, it's just, you got these three big problems. Let's just focus on problem number two. Like I was saying, let's look at that word hatam. What does it really mean to seal up vision and prophecy? Um, to seal up, if you look up the word hatam, Strong's H2856, uh, it means to lock up, to be stopped. And then if you look closer at the definitions here, it's, it's to make an end. Okay? Make an end of prophecy when the 70 weeks are done. So I want to show you real quick a connection to Daniel uh, 12, 4. Chapter 12, verse 4. It says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. I just want to show you how Hatam is used. It's, it's in this particular verse, just to kind of give you a little bit more context and background that it, in fact, it is talking about to make an end, but look at, it says, shut up and seal. 
shut up the words and seal the book. So it's kind of interesting. There's two different words here used, satam and hatam. Uh, first one, satam, that means to stop up, to keep secret. That's actually what it means. And then we look at, again, hatam, it means to make an end. So what, what Daniel was being told was, make the word secret and hidden and make an end to the book. <laughs> that's what he was told. And so it, it just shows you again that, that, that to make an end of prophecy is supposed to happen at the end of the 70 weeks. But um, also keep in mind, and the reason I brought this up is, is that the words were made secret or hidden. That's why, you know, until the time of the end, they were made secret and hidden. Now that we're at the time of the end, it's, it's being unsealed. It has been unsealed. I've unsealed it on this podcast. That 49 year periods are, you know, that's the missing link that nobody just was able to figure out that it's 49 year periods for each Shabua, you know. And so anyways, prophecy will hatam at the end of the 70th week, not after 70 weeks plus a thousand more years. It's just not, that's not what we're being shown here. Uh, we're just not being shown. I've shown you Daniel and Yeshua. Those are two witnesses that are saying it's all going to be done. So how do we reconcile this? How do we reconcile this? Okay. Well, we already know the 70 weeks prophecy is, has been unsealed to our understanding. So I need you to watch episodes two through seven of the podcast if you have not already. Uh, obviously, if you've you know been subscribing, you, you've already checked all that out. Uh, I, I won't spend too much time here, but just... I've already shown how we're living in the final 49 year period of the history of mankind as we know it. 2020 was the middle of the week. Right now is the year 2022. And, you know, this is according to Genesis 6, 3, that we have 120 cycles of mankind. Daniel told us that there's 70 Shabuah. And we're basically told that all prophecy is done by the year 2045. Specifically, Aviv 2045 is when all the, the 70 weeks are completed. Aviv being the first month of the year in the Hebrew. So we're running out of time. Okay. We need to have our eyes and ears open because we're running out of time. Like look how many years we have left, like 22 years roughly. Okay. So remember, I just showed you this, but all things written are going to be fulfilled very, very soon. Yeshua told us this. Okay. Very, very soon. As soon as the abomination of desolation happens, which I've already shown you, I've proved to you that it's going to happen next year from 2023 to like 2045. 2023 to 2045, everything has to happen. Okay, we're running out of time. So questions we need to ask in order to understand what is going on here with this thousand year reign and all this stuff is when exactly was Satan bound? That's the first question I'm gonna, gonna, we need to ask, okay? The second question is what is the thousand year reign exactly? And then when is Satan going to be loosed? Has he been loosed already? What's going on here? What's going on here? Okay, remember, Okay, before I answer these questions for us, before we look at these questions, the events of the book of Revelation are not in chronological order. They're written in symbolic manner many, many, many times, and they're not simple to understand. So we're going to be talking about the book of Revelation quite a lot in this, in this, in this presentation. And I, I, I promise, when you're done watching this, like 90%, probably 80 to 90% of the book of Revelation is finally going to make sense to you. There's some parts where it's like, okay, I don't totally understand that, but I promise you 80 to 90% of the entire book of Revelation is going to be open to your understanding. Not only that, um, you're going to understand a lot of New Testament passages once I'm done just unpacking this step by step. Our golden rule to figure out all these little prophecies is this is our golden rule. We are not going to deviate from this. Yeshua is the one who gave John this revelation. So we must let his words, as recorded in the Gospels, define our understanding of this book. Okay? Because, yeah, the thousand-year reign, all this, all this doctrine is derived from the book of Revelation, but we cannot ignore the words of our Master Yeshua. He is the one that is going to define this understanding for us. Okay? Because when was, it, when was Satan bound? Oh my gosh, when you look at this, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, it's all going to make sense. I'm just excited to share this with you. Okay. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. In Luke, I I didn't put this in the presentation, but in Luke chapter 10, I forget which verse, he's just finished sending out the 70 and he literally, Yeshua literally says that he sees Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's in Luke chapter 10. But he, he literally told us, Yeshua literally told us that Satan was bound 
he was cast out in the first century AD. Okay. He, he, and then, the, okay, let's, let's compare this. Let's compare this scripture with Revelation 20, uh, which we already read a little bit, but let's go ahead and look at it where it says, well, let's just read it. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. Revelation 20 verse two, he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. If you look at the words, cast, cast out, it's the same exact Greek uh, word. And what you, if we compare these two, um, this is Strong's uh, 1544 versus Strong's 906. I'm not very good at Greek, so I don't, I'm not going to attempt to like actually transliterate a lot of these things. But anyways, looks like ekbalo and balo. I don't know how you, how you say it. But if you look at these words, okay, it's the same thing. To cast out, drive out, send out with violence, to, to throw, to, to, to expel, to send away. So Yeshua told us that he... Now, in the first century, the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. It's just amazing when you look at this and, and compare it to Revelation. That's exactly the same thing. So what else did Yeshua tell us? You know what else he told us? The binding of the strong man. Okay, this is Matthew 12. And we've already covered this in another episode. But Matthew 12, 25. This is where, where the unpardonable sin happens. And they say, oh, you cast out demons because you, you, you cast out demons by Be Beelzebub. You have a demon. And Yeshua, this is what he says, But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Matthew 12, 26. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? But therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God... Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. So again, if you want more information about the unforgivable sin, check out episode 12 of the podcast. I do a huge deep dive into the, what the unforgivable sin is. That actually prompted Yeshua to start saying some of these things that he's saying. Now, let's zoom in on Matthew 12, 29 binds the strong man. If you look at that word, binds the strong man, it's to tie, fasten with chains, throw chains. Um, and it, it literally is to be in bonds. It's, 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 it's to be restrained. Okay. And that's exactly, listen to me. This is exactly what happened at the cross. And I'm going to play a clip here. This is from Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ in 2004. And you know what? He absolutely nailed it. He absolutely nailed it. Uh, he did such a good job presenting this in his in his film that he wrote, co-wrote, and directed. It's just so well done. Watch this clip with me and just look at how this is portrayed. So let's go ahead and watch this. So Yeshua, as you can see, the Romans are saying, hey, make sure that he's dead. So they stick the spear in his side. And... My gosh, man, this is so accurate. But be because of the cross, Satan has been bound. And um, it, it's, yeah, you just take a look at the Roman soldier. He's, he's you know, he's getting the blood. The wa blood and the water came out. Separation, meaning that he was for sure dead. And there it is. Look at how this is depicted. He's freaking out yelling and look at the abyss look at how he's bound so well done so well done he absolutely nailed it this film was absolutely you know i would say it's ins it was inspired to sh to, to show that <clears throat> because that's exactly what the scriptures teach us that the, that the ruler of this world is going to be cast out Okay. Now, if you still don't believe what Yeshua said, I want to, I want to, I want to point you to to a few more witnesses. Look at what look at what Paul says in, in Colossians two. We're going to look at verse thirteen. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, 
having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So what this means is, the handwriting of requirements, the record of your sins is blotted out by Yeshua because of the cross. And look what it says. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them, uh, triumphing over them in it. Look at that. Look at the word disarm. Strong's 554. To spoil. He, he, he ruined. He put off. He ruined principalities and powers at the cross. This is what Yeshua did. So amazing. He disarmed them. Okay. And look what, look what John, 1 John says, okay? 1 John 3, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's exactly what happened at the cross, okay? And then look at what Hebrews says. Hebrews 2, 14. He says, it, the writer here says, Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of the fle of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. It's so amazing. Read Hebrews chapter 2. It's so amazing. But I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking because it, okay, if Satan was bound in the first century and that's what, that's what Yeshua said, the ruler is going to be cast out, then why is the world so full of evil? Why is there so much corruption in the world still? And so really to answer this question is, we should be asking, it, how was Satan bound? Okay. We need to look up this word where it says that he was bound for a thousand years so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. This is Revelation 20, verses 2 and 3. We need to look at this, because there's a connection here. When you look at the word bound, there's a connection here to Romans chapter 7, verse 2. It's the same Greek word. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. This is really self-explanatory. Paul's just going through here and saying, hey, look, this is what it means to be bound by the law uh, in, you know, adultery. That's very straightforward. If you've read the Torah, if you've read the law, you understand what this means, being bound. The marriage is, is a covenant that's binding it's uh, till death do us part, right? We, we say that all the time in English, till death do us part. So what I'm going to say is, this is an easy connection to make. Satan is bound by the law of Revelation 20, verse 3. The law that he is bound by is that he is not allowed to deceive the nations. He is not allowed to deceive the nations. It literally says that he, 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 he was shut up. He was cast into a bottomless pit. A seal was put on him so that he should not deceive the nations. Okay, now I want to show you something from the book of Job. We're going to do a quick detour to the book of Job because I want to show you some really interesting stuff from the book of Job. Just the first chapter. The first chapter is quite amazing. Look at uh, Job 1.6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yehovah and Satan also came among them. And Yehovah said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered Yehovah and said, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then Jehovah said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered Jehovah and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now... Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And Jehovah said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. 
only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of Yehovah. Okay, what we're gonna we're, what we're gonna show you now, what we're gonna what we're gonna show you in the scriptures here is the power of Satan. Look at his power. This is really this this is like one of the few places in the scriptures where you really see his power on full display and what he's capable of. Okay, so we're gonna start in Job one thirteen. Now there was a day when the son, when Job his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and a messenger came to Job and said. The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when Sabians raided them, took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came out and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. So look, this is so clear. Look at what it says in Job 1.16. That the, the servant, one of Job's servants came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and people and servants. That's, that's really, that's, that's freaky, right? That's freaky that that happened. Fire literally came down out of heaven. But what, I, what, what, what I'm showing you here is that the law of Revelation 20 verse 3 does not allow Satan to have this kind of power right now. He is absolutely not allowed to deceive the nations with lying wonders and pretending to be God because the servant literally says fire of God fell from heaven. That's not true. He was deceived. Okay? Job's servant was deceived. And that's exactly what is, can't happen right now. So Satan's power is limited. He can't do stuff like this. So the second question you should be asking is, who exactly is Satan? And again, we're addressing that question. Why is the world so full of evil? Okay. And, and the problem is most people don't, don't, don't ever look up the word Satan. Because if you look up the word Satan, it just means adversary. The first time the word Satan is used is in Numbers 22, 22. And it literally says that the angel of Yehovah took his stand in the way as an adversary against Balaam. And while Balaam was riding on his donkey, his two, and his two servants were with him. Okay, it's talking about the angel of Yehovah being a Satan, right? That doesn't make any sense. So the first time we see the Hebrew words Satan, which is Satan, or it's, it's just talking about the angel of, of God. So what I'm going to say is that there's actually more than one Satan, because the word Satan means superhuman adversary. That's all it means. You look it up in the Strongs. It means superhuman adversary. So the first one that we see in the scriptures is the serpent. You see this in Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which Jehovah Elohim had made. And he said to the woman, has in God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Okay, that, that, that's where you see him. And we find out in Revelation 20 verse 2 that this serpent of old is actually the devil and Satan. In Revelation 12, 9 says the same thing, that this is the devil and Satan. So actually the serpent of old is a great dragon, the devil and Satan. So that is the first, what I'm going to say is that's the first supreme superhuman adversary. He is the leader. He is the, he's the ruler of this world, Yeshua called him in John 12, right? That was cast out. But he, there, he is like the head of all the fallen. The demons, the spirits, the fallen angels, you name it. He is the supreme ruler. He's the leader of them. Okay, the second one we're going to look at, though, is Azazel. Azazel is quite quite interesting and quite different. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but just when, when you look up the word uh, scapegoat, talking about the, the, uh, the sin offering and everything that has to do with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, it, Leviticus 16, actually, you see the word scapegoat used three times. Once in Leviticus 16.8 and twice in Leviticus 16.10. And let me just read Leviticus 16.8. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for, the, for Yehovah and the other lot for the scapegoat. You look up that word scapegoat 
It means Azazel. And this is only used three times in the Bible. And there's really no context. Like, it's, it's, it's really strange. So you actually, the only place that I've been able to find information about Azazel is Enoch. You look at Enoch 8, and it literally says, this is from the Ethiopic uh, version of Enoch, not the Hebraic or the Slavonic, but the Ethiopic it says, and Azazel taught men to make swords and daggers and shields and breastplates. He showed them the things after these and the art of making them bracelets and ornaments, the art of making up the eyes and of beautifying the eyelids and the most precious stones and all kinds of colored dyes, colored dyes. And the world was changed and there was great impiety and much fornication and they went astray and all their ways became corrupt. And Enoch uh, 9, 6 says, See then what Azazel has done, how he taught all the iniquity on the earth and revealed the eternal secrets that are made in heaven. And it literally says, like, th this, this book, again, it's an extra biblical book, you know, take it with a grain of salt, I guess. I'm, I'm still not necessarily 100 convinced that Enoch is scripture. Um, I, it's definitely good commentary. It, 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 in this case, it's the only place you really read about Azazel, uh, you know, from a Hebraic uh, work. Um, and so what it says in Enoch 10, 8 is that the whole earth has been ruined by the teaching of the works of Azazel and against him, right? All sin. So that, that explains Leviticus 16 quite well. So that's another superhuman, superhuman adversary though, because if we go back, it says that he is reserved in chains forever. Uh, he's actually thrown on jagged and sharp stones and covered with darkness forever. That's Enoch 10, 5. So Azazel is different. That's a different uh, superhuman adversary. And the third one I'm going to show you are the demonic princes of nations. This is where I believe this is where you and I fight the most battles. This is where you and I struggle the most. And look what it says in Daniel 10, 4. And when I mean struggle, I mean, this is, this is where our, our battles really come from. I believe in the spiritual realm as from the demonic princes and hosts of nations, because look what it says in Daniel 10, 4. Now, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose waist was girded with the gold of Bufaz. Look what it says. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel. This is verse 12 of 10. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me for I had been left alone there with the Kings of Persia. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? This is verse 20 now. And I, now I must return to fight with the Prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the Prince of Greece will come the Prince of Greece. So we see two demonic princes here. In fact, there's probably more because it says Kings of Persia. Why would an angel be fighting with Kings of Persia? So there's a lot of demonic princes here that rule over territories. It's very, very clear. And as we look at this even more, Ezekiel 28, 12 says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says Yehovah Elohim, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and in perfect beauty. Perfect in beauty. You were an anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways. From the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So it's calling a physical man, the king of Tyre, an anointed cherub. A cherub being an angelic uh, being. It's a demonic prince of some sort. Okay, it's the king of Tyre is a demonic prince. So it's, it's another demonic host of that particular region in the world. And we see this again in Ezekiel 38. It's chapter 1, uh, 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 Ezekiel 38, 1, 2, and 3. Now the word of Yehovah came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And it says, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. So you see here again, <clears throat> three more regions with demonic princes, Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. It, 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 to me, it, it's showing here that there's three demonic princes. And what I'm going to show you later in Revelation 16 is that the, th the three unclean spirits like frogs are actually Rosh, Meshach, Tubal. And this, th they actually are sent out to those regions for the great battle of Armageddon. That's Revelation 16 verses 13 and 14. I'll get to that later. I don't want to spend too much time on that right now at this moment. 
And then, so another superhuman adversary, number four, is Lucifer. And by the way, this is not meant to be an all-inclusive list. This is not meant to be all-encompassing. There are a lot of demonic things uh, in the scriptures that, that you know, anyways, th these different uh, principalities and powers. But it literally says in Isaiah 14, uh, verse 4, Take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how you, and then, and then in verse 12, it says, so if we just skip a little down, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. So it's calling the king of Babylon, Lucifer. Okay. So I have to conclude that Lucifer is the spiritual entity of Babylon. It's the, it's the prince. It's the host of that region. And the list goes on and on. Baalzebub. Uh, Apollyon, there's all these different different princes and hosts and demons and angels and God, it just goes on and on. I don't want to spend too much time, but this is why Paul said in Ephesians 6, 11 and 12, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the trickery of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Notice that Paul didn't say we wrestle against uh, 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 the devil and Satan, but he, you know, he didn't say that. He, there's more. There's more on the table. There are more things out there, spiritual hosts of wickedness, that Elohim and His divine Majesty, our God, has allowed to have a little bit of authority for this time period. It's just the way it is. Um, and what we see here now is something special. I'm going to start doing throughout this presentation. Okay, because now that we've kind of answered this first question of when was Satan bound, we're going to start, I'm going to start doing this each step of the way. Okay, we're going to look at the word made flesh. What are his words versus the words of men? So what did, what did the word made flesh say? And what are the words of men that they're, they're trying to tell us to what to believe? Okay, so the word made flesh said in John 12, 31b, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. In Matthew 12, 21, he said, How can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? So Yeshua made it very clear. And then in Luke 10, which I did not include, it says that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's Luke 10. Yeshua told us Satan was bound in the first century. But what do men try to tell us? That Satan is loose right now, doing whatever he wants, deceiving the nations however and whenever he wants, and it's just not true. The main ruler, the prince, the, the, the leader is currently bound. He cannot do this. But everybody teaches all the doctrines of men that Satan is loose right now doing whatever he wants. And that's just not what Yeshua taught. So we've answered the question number one. When was Satan bound? Now we're going to get into the thousand year reign. Okay, so what's this thousand year reign? This is one of the verses that's used to talk about the thousand year reign. It's Revelation 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay. Pay attention to the word thousand. It's kil kilioi. <laughs> Kilioi, it means, if you look it up in the Strongs, 5507, uncertain affinity. It literally says that, uncertain affinity. And if you see how it's used, it's a symbolic number, okay? This is not literal. Because if you look at 2 Peter 3, 8, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Okay? That's Psalm 50, verse 10. So, he, you know, are there a thousand hills in the world? Of course not. Th th there's more than that. But it's, it's just figurative. It's a symbolic number, a thousand. Um, I, uh, with 2 Peter 3, 8, um, what he's talking about there is the patience, how patient God is. That one day is like a thousand years to him. He's that patient. He's so patient. That's what, that's what Peter's talking about. So he's using the, the, the word symbolically, a thousand. If you look at Psalm 105, verse 8, it's even more clear that God remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations. So it, it literally says that forever is a thousand generations. 
That doesn't make any sense, right? So, so how can forever be a thousand? A thousand be forever. So it's a symbolic. A thousand is used not just in the Greek in a symbolic way, but a thousand is used in a symbolic way in the Hebrew as well. So again, let's look at the scripture that everybody uses for the millennial reign doctrines that we that we know, that I grew up understanding, that I was taught in all the churches I went to, and you know, quite frankly, some churches don't even teach this stuff because they're too busy, you know, hustling people for their money. They don't even get to the, like the meat of the word, and they don't even get to like the eschatology or end time studies. Like so many churches I've been to didn't even like touch it because they don't even get around to it. But the churches that are actually a little bit more faithful to go line by line. Uh, you know, verse by verse, uh, you, they eventually teach this doctrine. And this is what they kind of use to really come up with a lot of ideas of what the millennial reign is. So Revelation 20, verse 5, let's start there and we'll read verse 6. That's the main verse. It, 20, verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So that's Revelation. I just read Revelation 20, verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. Okay. So in order to understand what the thousand year reign is, you have to actually understand that there are two reigns of Yeshua. This is so key. This is so key. First, we have the thousand year reign. Absolutely. That's very clear. But we also have the forever and ever reign. And uh, hardly anybody teaches about this. Hardly anybody touches on this. Okay. So let's look at the thousand year reign. Okay. Here's a high level overview of what I'm about to show you. And I'm going to prove it to you with scriptures verse by verse. I'm going to show you exactly what we're, what we're looking at here with the thousand year reign. It began with Yeshua's ministry on earth, and this reign actually ends in Revelation 14, 14. I'll show you what, why and what that means. Number two, the forever and ever reign actually begins when he leaves heaven and returns to earth to destroy his enemies once and for all at the battle of Gog and Magog in Revelation 20, verse 9. So let's dive into this, okay? The arrival of the thousand year reign, okay? Matthew 3, this is what it says, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of Jehovah, make his paths straight. Okay, this was the same message of Yeshua. Matthew 4.17 From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the exact same thing that John was saying. So, again, if we look up these words here, let's just look at at hand. What does it mean for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Uh, and gizo is the word there in Greek. It means to bring near, uh, to come near, to approach. Uh, to a, I'm going to say it's to arrive. It's come near. Okay? The kingdom of heaven has arrived. It's come near. It's here. Okay? And this is why John was so great. You have to understand why Yeshua said this in Matthew 11:11. 11, 11. Uh, surely, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And this is what it says in verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffer, suffers violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. Let's unpack that a little bit with Luke 16, 16 actually gives us more clarity. It says, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Since John, the kingdom of God has been preached. That's why he was so great, because he actually announced the arrival of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is right now. This is what I'm going to show you. Okay, It's happening right now. Because when Mark 16, 19 happened and Yeshua was about to ascend up to heaven, this is what it says. So then the Lord, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. This is so key, the connection here to Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2. A Psalm of David that Yehovah said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. 
Yehovah shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Look at what that psalm is saying. Look at what Mark and everybody else is saying in the New Testament about the right hand. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. I can give you so many verses that talk about the right hand. That Yeshua is seated right now at the right hand of the Father. Matthew 26, 63. This is when he was being interrogated, okay? It, and uh, he, he was being held. I believe it was the high priest was talking to him, but he was being held before he was crucified. And, and it says in six, verse 63 of Matthew 26, But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven, the right hand of power, he's seated right there. Hebrews, okay, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of verses I could show you to talk about the right hand, of how Yeshua is seated at the right hand. I really like Hebrews. It's another witness here. Uh, let's just read verses 1, 2, and 3. God, who at very, uh, of chapter 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's right there at the right hand. So he's reigning right now. The thousand year reign is right now. So the question you probably have, which is the same question I had when I was really first starting to dig into this, is why does this reign only last a thousand years? Remember what he said. Remember what Yeshua said to us, okay? You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. This is John 15, 14. Then he says, no longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. So you and I, if we do Yeshua's commandments in the Torah, if we do what he says is commanded in the New Testament, if we do the things that are pleasing to him, he actually calls us friends. But he didn't reveal one specific thing to us. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. That's Matthew 24, 36. And then in Matthew 24, 42, it says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. I could give you more scriptures than that. These are just three. But he literally said, We don't know the day or the hour when he's coming back. We don't know the day or the hour when Yeshua is returning. This is why Revelation calls it a thousand year reign. That's happening right now. Okay? And I'm going to continue to prove to you that it is a thousand year reign right now, not in some future time. He literally says, you don't know when he, we don't know when I'm coming back. That's why it says it's a thousand years. We're not told that it's 1,961 years that they're going to be reigning with Christ. 1,989 years or 2,001 years that they're going to be reigning with Christ. No. The word in Greek can be used to say it's an uncertain affinity. It's a figurative, symbolic language. It's, it's just... It's specifically symbolic. There you go. It's not specific, giving us the day of his return. I'm going to unpack that more. But what John, what John does, again, in Revelation, he's, he's, he's a wise servant. I don't think he knew because he said, Yeshua told us no man knows the day or the hour. So John didn't even know. But, so what he did when he wrote Revelation, he just put a thousand years and it was concealed. The exact timing of Yeshua's return and the initiation of the coming forever and ever reign was all concealed. It was hidden. So let, let me show you a high level overview now. Let me show you a diagram just to recap what we just talked about. So the thousand year reign actually started with John the Baptist according to Luke 16, 16. The thousand year reign started right there in the first century. And it's going to end? We don't know. There's a question mark there. We don't know when the thousand year reign ends because no man knows the day or the hour of Yeshua's return. It will happen at the end of the 70th Shabuah, but is it the exact end? Probably not because there's some things I'm going to show you that are going to happen. But sometime, sometime before the end of the 70th Shabuah, 
he will come back, Yeshua will come back, and the thousand-year reign will end. That's currently happening right now. Again, that's why John the Baptist was, was, he was the greatest. He was the greatest born from among women. Born from among women, meaning that he wasn't born, he wasn't born again. Uh, he, he, he was already doing and pre preaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God without having been born again. He was just born of women. That's what he means by that, in my opinion, just based off of my studies. But he was, the reason John the Baptist was so great is because he announced the thousand year reign of, of Yeshua. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? That he was the forerunner prophesied by Isaiah. He was, he had such a unique, amazing responsibility. And it, he, he did a, he did a phenomenal job. He did a great job, but he had such an amazing ministry to announce the arrival of the kingdom. Nobody else had that. That's just so amazing. So let's continue unpacking this. We've already read Revelation 24. And uh, yeah, we already read Revelation 20 verses 5 and 6 also. But just remember that it, there's a lie in here. Uh, because you're probably wondering, okay, well, hang on, hang on. If the thousand year reign's happening right now, it says that the so John saw the souls of those who had been beheaded and they had not worshipped the beast or his image or received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. So like, what's the mark of Revelation 24? Like, how is that possible? That sounds like a future event, right? And then if we go back to Revelation uh, 20 verse 5, there's, it's talking about a first resurrection at the end of the thousand years? Or, or what's going on there? Is it at the end of the thousand years? Is that what it says? So we got to look at the first resurrection. And then what's the second death? What's, what's that all about? I know it doesn't say it here, but... Oh yeah, it does in Revelation 26. Over such, the second death has no power. Those who are participants in the first resurrection. So what's the second death? So we have all these questions now. Because I've shown you, <laughs> I've shown you that Satan was already cast out. Okay. So now all of a sudden there's all these questions because it's like, okay, if Satan was already cast out, uh, if the thousand year reign already started with John the Baptist, oh, what, well, what, now we have all these questions and actually it's really easy to explain, but this is what 90% of people teach. This is what 90% of people teach. Okay. The 70th week happens, seven year period. Oh boy, seven year period, right? I know, we know better than that. But the second coming of Christ happens at the very end of the 70th week, okay? Satan is bound for a thousand years. And this is when the first resurrection happens according to pretty much 90% of people out there. So believers in Christ are resurrected. They're going to reign for a thousand years. And this is the first resurrection. It happens at the very end of the 70th week. This is what everybody teaches. Then you have a thousand year millennial kingdom. Then Satan is loosed at the very end. Uh, the, the rebellion of Gog and Magog happens, but you know, they're all destroyed. Then the second resurrection happens. Everybody is, is, who has ever basically died is resurrected. The great white throne judgment happens. The wicked are thrown in the lake of fire. And that's that. So 90% of people are teaching that there is a gap. There is a gap between the first resurrection and the second resurrection. And that gap is a thousand years. This is what everybody teaches. There is a 1,000 year gap between the first resurrection at the second coming of Christ at the end of the 70th week and the second resurrection that happens after Magog and Magog are destroyed in the final satanic rebellion. I've already shown you how this cannot be possible though, according to everything I've shown you from Daniel and what Yeshua's words are. This just can't be the case. So before we dive into this, this gap theory, there's a thousand year gap, I'm going to show you something. Look at the word here. In Revelation 24, that John saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. The word here is actually, well, it would we, we would pronounce it psyche, but the, the Strong's is saying it's pronounced suke, but it's the word psyche. The word soul is, it, it, it's talking about the essence of the person, different from the body, but it's not dissolved by death. It's eternal, right? It's distinguished from other parts of the body. This is just, this is what psyche is. So John saw the psyches of those who had been beheaded. They're in heaven. Okay. They're with Jesus, but they're, yeah, they're, they, it's the psyche. He saw the psyche. Okay. So how do we explain all this? How do we explain that John saw people in heaven? How, how do we explain all of these things? How do we explain this? Why did John see people in heaven who had been beheaded for their witness? Okay. This, what I'm about to reveal to you is the mystery of the gospel that Paul taught, that this, the first century believers all wrote down in their gospels, the ones that talked about it. What I'm about to show you is really the mystery of the gospel that so many people don't understand. 
And that's why they teach this stuff. They, they teach this. So there's a gap. And there's this first resurrection, second resurrection has a thousand year gap. The reason they teach this is because they don't understand the words of Yeshua. They didn't take him seriously enough. They didn't, didn't really care. It wasn't really important. Let me just look at the book of Revelation and get my doctrine from a super symbolic, figuratively written book that's out of order. Let me get my doctrine from that. And oh, Jesus' words really aren't that important. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to. So this is a heart check moment. I'm going to pause for a moment here. Let's check our hearts. How seriously do you take the words of Yeshua? Do you believe him or not? Seriously, let's let's dial in on this. Do you believe his words or not? Or are they just kind of like a suggestion? So I'm going to say, let's focus on this really, really carefully. Because he gives us the answer to all these mysteries in our face. If we just would take the moment to just really consider why he said the things that he said. And what I'm going to show you is John chapter 5 gives us so much. And this is just one place. There's more than this. But this is where we get a lot of the meat of the mystery of the gospel and the kingdom. Okay, let's start in verse 24 of John 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear his voice, (laughs) when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. This explains everything. I'm not even exaggerating. This explains everything because belief in Yeshua is the first resurrection. He already told us, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is, it now is, it now is. When the dead will hear his voice, The dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. This is exactly why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 6. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This is why Paul said what he said. The first resurrection happens in somebody's life the moment that they put their faith and trust in Yeshua and they surrender their life. The moment you surrender your life to Yeshua, you experience the first resurrection. And when you die, when you're absent from your physical flesh, blood and bone body, you are present immediately in the throne with with the Father. This is... What it means to be passed from death into life. You're not going to be coming into judgment. You've been written in the book of life. You're passing from death into life. This is so clear. This is so clear. Now let's get rid of the disinformation about about the gap theory. There's a thousand year gap. The men of this world, all the Bible teachers, the seminaries, all these people that write books and they're just, oh my gosh, man. They're saying that there's a gap. But Yeshua said, the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. There ain't no gap. There ain't no gap. John 5, 28 makes it so clear that all the dead hear his voice at the same time. So the second resurrection actually is what we what is called the last day. Yeshua calls it the last day. John chapter 6, verse 39 And verse 40, this is the will of the father who sent me that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. The second resurrection, I'm going to raise him up at the last day. So this, now I can show you. 
the truth. I can show you what we've been shown, not from a seminary, not from some pastors, not whatever. This is according to Yeshua. Look what it says. Or look what I have on the diagram here. Belief in Yeshua at, is the first resurrection. Anyone who believes in him has passed from death to life. That's the first resurrection. It happens when somebody says, yes, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to submit my and surrender my life to you. I want to do your instructions for my life. And there it is. Boom. They have passed from death to life. They have believed in the Son of God, the Lamb. That happens. Look, I have an arrow pointing at the cross. That that already happened a lot. That, that was available beginning in the first century. That was available. Okay. Now, after the second coming of Yeshua, at the end of the 70th Shabuah, there's the second resurrection. This, this occurs where all, 100% of the dead are raised at the same time. Okay? That will happen at the end of the 70th Shabuah because it's called the last day. Okay? At the last day, all prophecy is now fulfilled. Believers in Christ will be resurrected at the last day but they're not going to go entering into condemnation or judgment. They are going to be part of the reign forever and ever. That happens after the 70th Shabuah. This is what we're being shown. There's no thousand year gap. Belief in Yeshua is the first resurrection. And the second resurrection happens when all the dead are raised. And some will enter into the lake of fire. But those of us who have believed in the words of Yeshua, you get to be part of the forever and ever reign. This is what the scriptures teach. Okay? And then, guess what happens? Revelation 21, there's a new Jerusalem. There's a new heaven and a new earth. All that prophecy is fulfilled. And the last day, it's so amazing. It's so amazing. So, let's just go ahead and recap. Let's, re let's do a recap. This is pretty deep, right? This is pretty deep stuff. Is this making sense? Hopefully it's making sense. I know it's very deep. But the first and second resurrection, okay? We need to recap, okay? Because when a born-again person physically dies, their soul goes to be with Yeshua immediately. This is exactly what John saw. He saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Literally, that word means the, the axe was laid to them or they died for their witness. But the soul goes to be with Yeshua immediately. This is the first death. And the first resurrection already took place the moment they put their faith and trust in Yeshua. This is why Paul says this in Ephesians 2.5. Even when we were dead in trespasses... Yeshua, or we were made alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul says we are seated together in the heavenly places. This is so clear. Okay? Why would he say that? Because it's true. Because the same thing that John was saying. So now I've given you two witnesses. John, in the, in the, when he's writing Revelation, he said, I saw the souls of those in heaven. And here in Ephesians, we're literally told that we're, we, we sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, when we're made alive, when we are partakers of the first resurrection, the moment we believe. So, I want you to listen to this clip from David Carrico, okay? Because he, he's one of the few people that have been faithful to teach this message of what I'm showing you today. He is one of the few people that have been faithful to teach this. And I want you to hear what he has to say specifically about the resurrections and what this what this all looks like. So check out what David Carrico, this is from FOJC Radio, and he does an amazing job. Let's check it out. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself and the time was right then Jesus was walking the earth he was teaching the words of eternal life everyone that believed those words and believed that he was sent from the Father they received eternal life they were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life there was a quickening there was a life-giving event there was a resurrection that took place in them of the soul and the spirit that would one day make that soul and spirit conformable for union with that resurrected body. Wasn't that good or what? 
Yeah, David, he, David Carrico does a really good job. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Nice TV, FOJC Radio. Those guys do a really good job uh, with certain topics. Sadly, our, our brother David Carrico doesn't understand the 70 Shabuah. He also believes in a seven-year uh, period for each week. But what he says about the, the resurrection, the glorified body, is so, so on point. Because when the thousand-year reign is completed, which we're in right now, all of those born-again souls will be raised up on the last day and given a new, incorruptible body. But you have to have had the first resurrection and, and gone from death to life with a, a soul and a spirit that are alive in order to receive that incorruptible body. It's just the way it is. You can't put a dead soul in an in a incorruptible, glorified body. And this is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So we are going to receive a new body and be raised up and reign in the kingdom of forever and ever, the new Jerusalem, in, an, in, a, in a glorified state where there's no more sin, no more, no more tears, no more, none, none of that. So the next question you're probably wondering though is, okay, well that answers that, but what about the mark? What's the mark of Revelation 20 verse 4? Because it says that the souls of those people did not, they didn't receive the mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And like, okay, this has to be a future event because the mark on the hand of the forehead hasn't happened yet. The beast and his image, they haven't been worshipped yet. So how is this possible? But here's what I'm going to say. This has been happening for a long time. Look, I showed you in the last episode, remember? The 144,000? We talked about the connection of the Ezekiel chapter 9 to the 144,000, to the book of Jonah, to the church in Philadelphia. I showed you all these connections. I highly recommend the 144,000 first fruits of Revelation episode, uh, uh, episode 16 of the podcast. Because uh, what I'm going to show you now is that this has been happening for a long time. Let's just read Ezekiel 9 verse 3. Let's start there. Now the glory of God, the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it, had been, where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writer's ink horn at his side. And Jehovah said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to him, to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. So these angels go out and do what Jehovah commands them. But notice something very special here, right? We already talked about this last episode. The men that were sighing and crying in Ezekiel 9 were keeping the feast of Yom Kippur. They had the sign of the Sabbath day of Yom Kippur upon them. They were sighing and crying at the appointed time. There are a lot of people that sigh and cry over the abominations that are done in America, the United States and Canada, in, um, in Israel, or I don't know, name your country, the UK, the Europe. There are a lot of people that sigh and cry over the abominations that are done. But you know what? Sighing and crying over the abominations on the appointed time, a Sabbath day like Yom Kippur, that is what set these people apart back in the day, okay? Because what are we told about the mark of the Sabbath, okay? Exodus 31, 12. And Jehovah spoke to Moses saying, Speak also to the children of Israel saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am Jehovah who sanctifies you. Notice it doesn't say it's a sign between me and your church, your corporation, your 501c3, your pastor, your, your people that you're trying to please. It's a sign between, you know, it, it's a sign between you and him. So if he says, do my Sabbaths a certain way, you better figure out, right? We better figure out what those Sabbaths look like because it's a sign between me and you throughout your generations. So let's continue. Let's strive to, to please our, our Father in heaven and not please men. So if he says, you know, Yom Kippur, okay, let's do Yom Kippur. If he's, you know, that's a Sabbath day. There's, there's all these Sabbath days. The mark of the beast, what I'm going to say is the mark of the beast is actually profaning Sabbaths. Look what it says in Exodus 31, 14. You shall keep the Sabbath. Therefore, it is, uh, you shall keep the Sabbath. Therefore, for it is holy to you. 
Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Does it make sense now why Ezekiel 9 happened? Because there were other, the other people were not sighing and crying. They were not observing the fast of Yom Kippur in the appointed time. They were profaning it and they were put to death. It's really that simple. He already told us that's what he was going to do. So why should we be surprised? Women, little children, everything. There's a point when his patience runs out. Okay. And so now let's talk about the end of the thousand year reign. Okay. This is, this is going to tie up a lot of loose ends, I believe, in your understanding of this. Because look what it says in 1 Corinthians 15.25. Yeshua must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And this is the same thing. I already read this to you. Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Okay? And this is the end of the thousand year reign. Actually, it begins, it starts to begin in Revelation 11. Let's just read 11 verses 15 through 19. It says that the, the seventh angel sounded and there was a loud voices in heaven. The kingdoms of this world and the, have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, that you that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. So the two things I want you to I want you to see here in Revelation 11 it says that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Then it says that the temple of God was opened in heaven. These are very significant events because by the time we get to Revelation 14:14 14, 14, I looked this is what John says I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So if he's sitting on a cloud, he's no longer seated at the right hand of the Father. And this, this is the exact moment when the thousand year reign ends. This is the exact moment because he's ready to reap the harvest of the earth in Revelation 14. And there are two harvests in Revelation 14. Okay. There are two harvests. The first one is good. This is Revelation 14. Uh, we just read 14. So let's look at 15 and 16. And another angel came out of the temple. Remember, the temple was open in Revelation 11. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So like I said, this, this first harvest is good. So what I think this is actually referring to is the regathering of the 12 tribes of Israel. The harvest of the earth. I believe it is the 12 tribes of Israel being regathered to the land of Israel. That's what he's harvesting here. It's not super clear, but I, that's my speculation. Let's look at what happens next, though. I think it's going to clear things up because the second harvest of Revelation 14 is wrath. Verse 17. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Okay, notice two things here. Power over fire in Revelation 14, 18, 14, 18, and then Revelation 14, 20, outside the city. This is describing the exact same event in Ezekiel 38, 39, and Revelation 20. Because look what it says in Revelation 20, verses 9. That Gog and Magog surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's exactly what's talked about in Revelation 14. So this is the same event of Ezekiel 38, 39. Revelation 20 is the same event of Revelation 14, the, the harvest of wrath. So 
Now we're going to look at the forever and ever reign, okay? We're going to look at the forever and ever reign. This is Revelation 21. Uh, in verse 1, let's start there. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Sorry, if you know, if you enjoy the ocean and things like that, sorry, there's no more ocean in the new in the new heaven, new earth. Anyways, Revelation 21, 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. This reminds me of that verse where Yeshua says, All things have passed away. All, you know, Behold, I make all things new. It's so beautiful. So, I know we covered a lot of ground. I know we covered a lot of ground, okay? <laughs> we covered a lot of ground. Let's recap some ideas here. But look, before we do, let's look at what the Word made flesh said. And then let's look at the words of men, what they've been teaching us and trying to get us to believe for a while now. So the word made flesh said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand in Matthew 14, 17, B. So Yeshua told us the kingdom of heaven has arrived in the first century AD. Okay, what the what men teach is that in the last days and at the end of the Daniel 70th week, the kingdom of heaven will arrive on earth for a thousand years. <laughs> That's so ridiculous that's so ridiculous once you put all these pieces together like i've done today john 5 25 most assuredly i say to you the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the son of god and those who hear will live so yeshua told us our master in heaven told us the first resurrection was now available to believers from the first century a.d all the way until this exact moment in time Beautiful, beautiful. But what men say is that the first resurrection will not take place until the last days at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. Then there's a thousand year reign that will begin for those resurrected people only. <laughs> it's just not, that's not what, that's not what he taught. There's no gap. There's no gap between the first and second resurrection. There's no gap. Okay. <laughs> there just isn't. Oh my gosh, man. Anyways, anyways, John 5, 28. Let's look at what, what else did he say? Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. So Yeshua told us 100% of the dead will hear his voice at the same time. But what do men teach? Men teach there is a thousand year gap between the first resurrection at the end of the 70th week of Daniel and the second resurrection at the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20, 11. It's just not true. He said all who are in the graves, will hear his voice. Men want to say that some are going to hear and some are not going to hear. That's just not, it, it is literally twisting the word of God. Okay, it is. It's just straight up is. So we answer the question, when exactly was Satan pound? What is the thousand year reign? Okay, in order to answer the thousand year reign, you had to understand, okay, well, what's the resurrections? First and second resurrection. What's the mark of the beast? Like, how does that fit in? Sounds like a future event. Let me just pause here for a second. Because the mark of the beast, let's just talk about that really quickly. I feel like I there's a loose end there that I, I wanted to tie up a little better. But the mark of the beast, yes, there will be a physical, literal, right hand and forehead mark of the beast to be implemented later. When, basically, I, I believe it's when uh, Satan comes back out of that bottomless pit and so forth, which we're about to talk about next. But, yes, there will be a physical, literal, you know, mark of the beast. But... What it talks about in Revelation with the thousand year reign and the context of all that is that the mark of the beast has been happening for a long time. The mark of the beast, yes, it will be physical, literal at some point in the future, but it's been a spiritual mark. There's been a spiritual mark for a long time. Defiling God's Sabbaths, doing whatever is right in your own eyes, not keeping his Torah, but specifically the Sabbaths, the Shabbats, of all the holy days of Leviticus 23, every, every Shabbat, every single, every single week, but also the holy days. To me, when I read this, he said it's a sign forever. That truly is the mark of God. And the mark of the beast is anything that turns people away from having that sign of the Shabbat. Whether it's not even caring about the feast days. That's a big one for a lot of people. Most people are in that camp. They don't even care about the feast days. 
doing the feast days on the wrong time. That's kind of a tricky one. That's kind of a hard one for me to swallow because I know a lot of people that, that they, they do things out of tradition or whatever. And it's just, that's an issue. It's unintentional sin for a lot of people doing the feast days at the wrong time. But then also, you know, this whole idea of the mark of the beast, the mark of God, the mark of God is, is truly something that protects, it seals you. And there's just, it's, it's really sad. Many people are just not going to have that protection, it, it, but they, it's not to say that they're going to lose their eternity. Like, let's say if you're not observing the feast days at a specific time, but it, you know, it is going to be costing people their physical bodies. So I just wanted to kind of tie up that loose end because when John wrote the revelation, he saw souls in heaven already. Okay. Some people teach like the, the state of the dead in the, in the seventh day Adventist camp, or like there's different churches that teach that when you die, you go to sleep and then you're going to wake up way later. Like you don't, ex- you cease to like have memory or existence. And yeah, there's some scriptures I can pull from the old Testament to, to back up my, the point there, but it goes against what Yeshua taught. It goes against what Revelation shows us, that there are souls in heaven that have been beheaded. When John was alive, when he wrote the book of Revelation, he was being persecuted by Rome for being a heretic because he, he was teaching against uh, established doctrine. He was thrown in the island of Patmos, and he was in exile. He, he wrote the book of Revelation in exile. He wasn't in other words, people were being persecuted and beheaded. People were being persecuted by the time John came around already. And so when it says that people were being persecuted and then they, you know, the souls of them went up to heaven and they lived and reigned for a thousand years, that's been going on for a long time now. And John was recording it. Hey, I'm seeing these people there in heaven. They're ruling and reigning right now. And this is what the first resurrection is. This is what Yeshua taught us. He said that you pass from death to life. You are translated. Like David Carrico said, you're translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of life. And you're no longer uh, a slave to sin. There's certain things that are just so beautiful. But the main, main, main thing is that you're born again. And that doesn't mean coming out of your mother's womb twice. Born again of the spirit. And now you're able to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. This is this. All these scriptures you can figure out now. You can tie all these scriptures now to the proper understanding of the first resurrection. Okay. So now that we've understood all those things, we need to talk about Satan being loosed because here on my diagram, I show you that sometime before the end of the seven Yeshua, the bottomless pit is open. This is revelation nine. The three frogs are loose. That's revelation 16, 13, and then revelation 19, 20 and Ezekiel 38 and 39 are fulfilled. Okay. This is going to happen in the next 22 years. This should blow you away that we are living in this time period. This is so insane that you and I are alive to witness some of these things that are about to happen. This is insane. This is absolutely incredible. I'm blown away every time I think about this because sometime from now until the year 2045, all these things are about to happen. So let's look at the bottomless pit. The first thing on my list here is the bottomless pit. This is Revelation 9, verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I heard, I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running in the battle. They had tails like scorpions, and and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. 
and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Okay, let's take a look at that. The angel of the pit. If you look up the word Abaddon, it means destruction, the place of destruction. And it, it, what Strong's is saying here is the name of the angel prince of the infernal regions, the minister of death, and the author of havoc on earth, which I've already shown you from the book of Job. That's what Satan is capable of, because I do understand this to be Satan. I do understand this to be the Satan, not just adversary, but the main head honcho Satan. This is the main guy. This is the main guy. Because if you look up the word destroyer, Apollyon, it means destroyer. And again, it means just that. It means just that. It's really that simple. Destruction, destroyer. And if we look at Revelation 12, we have to connect the dots here on Revelation 12 because it says that war broke out in heaven and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven they're saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren. The accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. So listen, Job 1, 6, remember what we talked about, that Satan went to present himself before Yehovah. And what 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 does Satan do? He was accusing Job that he's, he's really not that righteous. He's going to curse you to your face the moment that you take away his comforts. That's exactly what Revelation 12, 10 says. He accuses before God day and night. So even though he's bound... He, even though he has been bound and cannot deceive the nations, that's why he's bound to, he's bound by that law, he accuses before God day and night. So, the question here is, wait a minute, why does Revelation 12.10 say that he has been cast down, Satan has been cast down after this war in heaven, and then why does Revelation 17.8 say that he ascends out of the bottomless pit? And that's not the only place. It talks about him ascending out of the bottomless pit in, in different places in Revelation. So which is it? Does Satan get cast out of heaven or does he ascend out of the bottomless pit? A release from the bottomless pit after the angel opens it with his key. This, this is the same event based on my current understanding. Okay. It's both of them are true. There's a war in heaven. He's still able, again, he's not bound in the sense that he's physically in a pit somewhere where he he's completely like, uh, in my opinion, chained up. Like that's that's what I read when I read all those Greek words. He's not chained up in the sense that he's completely immobilized. But in my opinion, he's able to still do things, but he's not able to deceive the nations. That is the only thing that we're told in Revelation that he is bound by. He cannot deceive the nations. He can't make fire come down from heaven and call it God. You know what I mean? And deceive all the nations with that stuff. So him being cast down from heaven and him ascending from the bottomless pit, to me, it's not a, it's not a deal breaker. It's the same event. It, it makes sense in my understanding. So in Revelation 16, so we, we talked about that first event of the bottomless pit being open. Now let's look at the three frogs because this ties into Gog and Magog immediately. So Revelation 16, 12, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For the spirit, they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them together, or to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. Now, it's interesting that there's an interjection there. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Yeshua interjects because 
he is going to be returning right around the time of this battle. That's when he is returning to Earth and the thousand year reign is completed until all enemies are subdued under him. Let's look at this in more detail. Revelation 16, 13. I saw three unclean spirits. What I'm going to say is this is Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And they're going to be gathered for the battle of that great day. Well, guess what that is? That's Armageddon. That's the battle of Gog and Magog. This is exactly what we read in Ezekiel 38. Let's look at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, say, Thus says Yehovah Elohim, I am, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma, from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited, this is verse 8, in the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. So what I'm going to say real quick, Gog and Magog will attack. This is very obvious. They're going to attack the regathered 12 tribes of Israel. The house of Judah and the house of Israel are going to be regathered and they are going to be attacked by Gog and Magog. And this is what it says in Ezekiel 38, 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says Jehovah Elohim, On that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, and all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. This is the doom of Gog and Magog. We read about this in Ezekiel 39, starting in verse 4. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open field, for I have spoken, says Jehovah, Elohim. And I will send fire on God, Magog and those who live in the security in the coastlands. Then they shall know that I am Jehovah. So, these are the same events of Revelation. Look at Revelation 14.20 with me. It literally says that the winepress of wrath was trampled outside the city. This is exactly what it says in Ezekiel 39.4. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel. That's outside the city of Jerusalem. Okay? If you look at also Revelation 19.17, it literally says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather for the great for the supper of the great God. And it literally says that in Ezekiel 39, 4. I will give you to the birds of every sort and to beasts of the field to be devoured. This is the great supper, the supper of the great God. So again, it's the same exact event. Just to prove it to you, it's the same event. Look at Revelation verse uh, uh, 20, verse 9. It, okay, well, let's let's actually read verse 7 because it actually ties all everything together real nicely. Now, when the thousand years have expired, the, the, the current reign of the kingdom that we're in right now, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, Jerusalem, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Real quick, did you see how it says the camp of the saints? The camp of the saints? Remember what we talked about in the 70 Shabbat decoded presentation. The word saint is kodesh in the Hebrew. It literally just means the set-apart people. And I've shown you already, way in advance, that, that that's talking about the 12 tribes. That's all it is, 12 tribes, the camp of the 12 tribes. And anybody who might be grafted in, including people who want to follow Jesus. You know, it's, it's the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, and then fire came down. So when it says fire came down, that's the exact same thing that we read in Ezekiel 39, 6. I will send fire on Magog. And that's exactly, it's the same event. It's the same exact event. So the question we need to ask, who are Gog, Magog, in the far north? There's a book that I uh, 
referenced to try and understand this because I don't really want to hear what, what modern day pastors and men and all these commentators have to say. I actually got this book here. It's called Gog and Magog in Early Eastern Christian and Islamic Sources. The subtitle is Salam's Quest for the Alexander's Wall. This book is really interesting. It's a very, very well researched. And it talks about all the early historical writings of what those people way back in the day, closer to the time when Revelation was written. I want to know what they thought Gog and Magog was. I want to see what they thought. And here's an overview. This is what this is a excerpt from the preface of this book. The biblical peoples of Gog and Magog, known to Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike, were believed to live in the world's extreme north. Moreover, in late Jewish and early Christian and Islamic tradition, they were supposed to have been enclosed behind a barrier, a gate or a wall, by Alexander the Great. In Islam, known as Iskandar, the two-horned, until prior to the last days, God would release these apocalyptic hordes to break out from behind their prison. What, what this book shows, actually, it provides a lot of evidence, is that the barrier or rampart, the wall, is to believe to be the Great Wall of China. I'm going to show you some more details about that in a moment. So what Alexander the Great and Eastern Christian sources say is that according to ancient geographical tradition, the entire Eastern Caucasus, the Caucasus Mountains, was called the Northern Land, the cold and mostly unknown region, was understood as being inhabited by uncivilized, warlike, and primitive peoples. Then, what the ancient Islamic sources say, because it is in the Quran, Gog and Magog are in the Quran, they say it's Armenia, Azerbaijan, or in the most eastern part of the land of the Turks. But the two mountains perhaps are also to be found between Armenia and Azerbaijan, or in the farthest north. So let's take a look at a map, and let's let's. This is just from Wikipedia, but let's take a look. Azerbaijan, we see Turkey, we see the Russian Federation, all of these nations. Georgia, all of them flank the lesser and greater Caucasus Mountains. Caucasus Mountains. Okay. This is what is being spoken of by Gog and Magog. I'm going to prove it to you. A little bit more here. Well, at least, that, at least that's what all these sources are saying, and I think it's accurate. I'm going to prove to you something, though, that's really interesting about the ramparts of Gog and Magog. Because what Rob Skiba found and what he wrote about in Archon Invasion, The Rise, Fall, and Return of the Nephilim, this is from page 579, uh, 579, he says, I actually discovered this as a result of going on a missionary trip to China in 2006. Let me pause right there. That's pretty brave, right? To go to a missionary trip in China where they don't allow Bibles. Okay, that's pretty cool. This is what he says. There I was privileged to stand on the Great Wall of China. What I didn't know, however, was that this amazing structure was originally known as the ramparts of Gog and Magog. And he's right. That is exactly what what that other book that I just showed you. That's what that shows as well. Here's what else Rob Skiba has to say in, in his book. Growing up, listening to teachers of eschatology, I always heard of the Gog and Magog. I've always heard of Gog and Magog as representations of China and Russia. Yet, if you continue to dig, you will find many paintings, sculptures, effigies, and stories, all depicting these two characters as apparently members of real giants who were descended from Japheth. Suddenly, it starts to make sense why someone would build, or would want to build, such a massive structure as the ramparts of Magog, it sure puts a whole new spin on the Ezekiel 38 war, doesn't it? And let's take a look at it right here on screen. The Great Wall of China. Look at that massive structure known as the Ramparts of Gog and Magog. That is literally the nickname of this. And so it just, again, proves the point that, you know, whether or not Gog and Magog are, are, are literal giants, there's definitely evidence to support that. I'll show you in a second. The main thing is to understand that from ancient times all the way until now Gog and Magog has always it's been associated with the Great Wall of China so you know all those areas Mongolia China the Tibetan Plateau all that's all that region fits into Gog and Magog but then we have Azerbaijan Georgia all the Caucasus Mountains areas Russia we have all these areas in the far north and it starts to make sense when you put all the pieces together real quick I thought this was really interesting it was in Rob Skiba's book he talks about the Royal Arcade in Australia in how there's Gog and Magog statues depicted, and they're depicted like this quite a bit as these statues. 
And what I find interesting is, well, I didn't believe him at first. I'm like, no, that can't be true. Let me go look it up. And sure enough, he was right. Because if you go to uh, atlasobscura.com and you look at Gog and Magog in Melbourne, Australia, this is literally from this website. This is what they say. These mythological giants take time out of their busy day guarding a Victorian market to let you know what time it is. So there's two statues and in the middle there there's a clock. But those two statues represent Gog and Magog in lots of literature, like, like Rob Skiba said, that they are represented in, in many different ways throughout the world in literature and so forth. And so there's evidence to support that these demonic princes, these demonic entities, are the deceased spirits of Gog and Magog who were actually literal giants, which are offspring of the Nephilim from way back in the day. So that just ties in maybe a little bit more clarity as to why these are enemies of God. And so what about Rosh, Meshek, and Tubal, though, right? Because we were told a lot of things. Uh, it's not it's Gomer. It's all these areas. It's like a lot of regions. I'm not going to cover all of them because it would just take too much time. So for the sake of time, I'll, I'll just show you what I found on BibleAtlas.org. That Meshek and Tubal is, is Asia Minor, specifically Turkey. So now Turkey is being thrown into the mix of this whole thing. And so now we're starting to get a clear picture that it's actually the sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Tubal, Meshek. This is from 1 Chronicles 1, 5. And so these final enemies of Israel are descendants from the sons of Japheth. And these armies will be under the control of Satan for a short period of time. Now, let's, let's have some fun recapping here. Let's go back and look at what the Word made flesh said. And let's look, let's look at the words of men. So, Luke 21, 22. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So what Yeshua told us, was that during the days of the abomination of desolation in 2023, until the end of the 70th Shabua, which is technically Aviv 2045, all prophecies in the entire Bible will be fulfilled. All of them. All things which are written may be fulfilled. What do men say? At the end of Daniel's 70th week, there will be peace on earth for a thousand years. Then Satan will be released from his prison, deceive the nations, gather up Gog and Magog, and try to attack the land of Israel, but he will be destroyed by Jesus. It's just not what Yeshua said. It's just not what he said. Those are the words of men. These are doctrines of men. These are not the doctrines of our master, Yeshua. So we have answered the questions, my friends. We've, we have answered the questions. When was Satan bound? First century. When's the thousand year reign? What is it? Started in the first century. It ends at an undisclosed period of time. But when it ends, Yeshua will return and he will destroy Gog and Magog. When is Satan to be loosed? He's loosed as soon as Yeshua gives the green light for the Gog and Magog invasion and the final harvest of the earth, the harvest of wrath. So what I'm going to say now is that, first of all, <laughs> hopefully this has been a transformation for you. You will be able to understand 90% of the New Testament probably maybe even close, maybe even 95% of the New Testament now. You'll understand so much more of what all the early leaders, the apostles, all these people taught. You're going to understand so much more now that you understand the first resurrection, the second resurrection, the glorified body, all these things. And what I'm going to say specifically though, is that this is a Samson moment for us. This is a Samson moment for you and for me. This is what Judges 16.20 says. And she said, this is Delilah, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that Yehovah had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. This is what I'm going to say. This is what I'm going to say. The eyes of the remnant have been gouged out by false interpretations, teachings that are void of the power of Elohim, and the doctrines of men that ignore, completely ignore, misrepresent, misquote, completely cast aside the current reign, the literal reign of our Messiah right now at the right hand of the Father. This is a Samson moment. Look what happens next. Look what happens in Judges 16, 27. When the temple was full of men and women, 
All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching Samson while, while he performed. Then Samson called to Jehovah, saying, O Lord Jehovah, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars, which supported the temple. He braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. I know the context is different. I know this is, you know, this is a... Uh, but this is something that came to me when I was putting together this presentation, that it's time for you and I, it's time for you and I to ask Yehovah, ask Yeshua, if you like saying Jesus, that's cool. Ask Jesus, strengthen me, strengthen me. Because it's time for us to rise up and claim the miraculous power of Elohim. These teachings that say, oh, the, the rain is going to happen later. They're ignoring the fact that we have miraculous power from Elohim. Why do you think? And again, this is not something that I was taught by men. When I was able to cast a demon out of myself. Who revealed that to me? That was not men who revealed that to me. That was the master in heaven who revealed that to me. And now I understand. I understand now why so many ministries out there, why so many people, teachers, pastors, leaders, all these all people, why so many of them do not teach about casting out demons, healing the sick. There's such a lack of power out there in all of these ministries. I understand now. It's because they never understood the first resurrection. It's, they never understood that the kingdom is right now and everything, everything is under the feet of our master Yeshua and he must reign until all enemies of his, are destroyed. But everything is under his feet. You think that, you know, they can just, uh, governments can run around and just nuke, you know, this country or that country whenever they want. You think they can just do whatever they want, however they want, whenever they want. No, it is our master Yeshua that gives them license, that gives them the ability to do things. But there's not Satan running around doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Our master in heaven right now is ruling and reigning. When you start to understand the gravity of what I'm saying here, you are going to start to experience really the true power that the book of Acts speaks of. And the reason they had so much power and authority is because they understood something that has been completely forgotten in this age. Look what it says in Revelation 3, 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your work. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. When you look at that word, little strength, look what it says. This was brought to my attention recently that I should look into this and look look what it says miraculous power that's actually what it means in the Greek miraculous you have a little miraculous power it's time for us to rise up and claim this miraculous power this dunamis that's what the word is in Greek it looks like dynamis Matthew 6 13 do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Behold, and this is Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It's time for us to rise up and claim the miraculous power of God in our lives. The kingdom is now. It's not later. And he has given us the keys. He wasn't just talking to Peter here. He was talking to you and me. He's, ta he's telling us, I have given you authority. Rule and reign with me right now. That's what he's saying. 
And remember, always remember, the first resurrection is now. Romans 8.11 says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So my question is, have you called upon the name of Yeshua? Have you believed His words? Have you surrendered your life to Him and have you sought to do His will and His instructions for your life? Because you can partake of that first resurrection right now over such, over whom, whoever experiences the first resurrection will not experience the second death. That is the mystery of the gospel. This is what the, the first century believers taught. This is what they understood. This is why they had so much miraculous power. Because they didn't believe in a, in a Yeshua that was caught up into heaven and he's just kind of like letting Satan run around and do whatever he wants. Rather, they understood and believed in a Yeshua that was raised up, seated at the right hand of the Father with his enemies under his feet. And what, what should really, what should really kind of, there's a lot. I know this is going to open up a lot of understanding in the scriptures because it did for me big time when I first started putting this together. But you have to understand how dark and how depraved the, the humanity's heart is because there's a lot of evil in the world right now. I mean, think about it. GMOs, you know, 5G, tracking and tracing people, the, you know, the COVID vaccines, like all these things, like, oh my gosh, like all the evil the, the, how science has been hijacked, how to, to basically manipulate and destroy people's lives. All these things that are present in this, in this world, demonic things, evil things, it's a result also of the darkness and the sin of mankind. It just shows you like what we're living through right now. Even though our master in heaven is reigning, even though the thousand year reigns right now, even though you can experience the first resurrection right now, it just shows you how dark the world is dark and full of darkness in a lot of ways because the heart of man is so deceitfully wicked above all things who can know it and and you know i think i think the devil gets a lot of glory and a lot of credit for all the evil in the world but you also have to understand now that i've shown you how clear it is that yeshua is ruling and reigning that it is actually he is 100 100% in control People say all the time, oh, he's in control, he's in control, but they don't teach it. Yes, Yeshua is in control right now, and his thousand-year reign is right now. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This is so clear now. This is so clear. There's no there's no going to sleep and you wake up like a, a while from now. And no, no. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This is happening right now. It's been happening. I think this is why Paul had such a fire and such a zeal to go preach the gospel, the good news of believing in the name of Yeshua, following after him. I think this is why he had such a fire and a zeal because it literally is a life-giving message. It is a life, it gives life, spiritual resurrection to the people who hear this message that Yeshua is the, the basically the atonement for our sins. He is the one that allows us to have new life if we believe in him and believe in his words and believe in the one who sent him. Belief is in something that is you just, it's a head knowledge, but it's a, it's something that requires action, not just a confession of faith one time. I said the Jesus prayer, oh, I'm good. Like all these people teach, all these fake pastors and preachers out there. Oh, you said the Jesus prayer one time back in 1970? Oh, you're good for life, bro. No, but faith and belief in Yeshua requires action. It requires doing his commandments. You are his friend if you do what he says. And so it's those people. It's those people that believe and take the action necessary of obedience and walking in a lifestyle of obedience, not to the doctrines and commandments of men, not to the Babylonian Talmud, not to whatever, but to his Torah, first five books of Moses, the prophets, Moses and the prophets, and then now you really got to pay attention to what Yeshua wrote down because there's some things that he really said, believe in me and believe my words. So it's, it's, it's really Genesis to Revelation. We have to look at all of the words inspired by God. And that, and walking that out, walk, trying to be you know faithful, growing, not remaining stagnant in your walk, or feeling like you have arrived, committing the unpardonable sin with your stiff neck, right? Hopefully that's not you. 
as long as we continue to be moldable, teachable, and faithful to just do the things that he commanded, Yeshua will raise us up at the last day. This is the hope. This is the, this, this is, this is the gospel. This is the first resurrection that can happen right now in your life. Put your faith and trust in Yeshua. And the second death will have no power over you. And um, again, I, I hope this has been a tremendous blessing to you. This information really blew me away when I first started unpacking it. Because now we can completely understand that the, the timeline all fits now. The timeline of the 70 Shabbat fits 100%. We're no longer, you know, we're no longer just shooting in the dark here. Like we understand this right here. I'm going to pull it up on the screen one more time. We understand that eternity begins and the rain begins and all prophecy is about to be fulfilled in the next 22 years, roughly. It's so amazing. I hope this information has been a blessing. I hope that you've been set free from the bondage of the traditions and doctrines of men that have been shoved down our throats. I hope that and pray that you will begin to really study and pay attention to all the words of Yeshua and take them very, very, very seriously. Take the words of Yeshua more seriously and, and literally than the book of Revelation. That's, that's, a good, that's a good starting point, right? And we've definitely done that today and we've accomplished a lot. And so if you've been here through this whole presentation, I pray that you're blessed and I pray that you would take this information, study it, prove it, test it, compare it to other scriptures and as you do that and as you find it to be basically legit because i mean it, it, to me this is it man like there's this explains daniel everything this explains everything share it share this message if, if if you've had that profound impact like i have from the truth of the word of god and all these lies and doctrines and commandments of men share the message share it people deserve to know what the thousand year reign is People deserve to be set free from superstition and bondage that Satan is in charge right now. No, it's not Satan. Yeshua is in charge. All right, my friends, take care. I will catch you next time and stay tuned for more episodes.